I think a lot of people are really scared to have these conversations and they're scared to even admit that it's a problem because they think that by talking about it, they are then admitting that their businesses are a part of it or they've done it. Welcome back to Dirty Linen. My name is Danny Vallant. Uh, if you have never listened to this podcast before, I am so happy to have you along for the ride. I am a Melbourne food journalist. And on this podcast, we talk about all things food and hospitality, digging into some issues that are hard to talk about, as well as the tasty stuff as well along the way. Uh, we put out a fortnightly newsletter across the Deep in the Weeds podcast network, which this podcast is very proud to be part of. If you are not signed up to our newsletter yet, please uh, check out the links in the show notes or on our socials because we would love to chat to you in that way as well. Um, Today on Dirty Linen, we have a return guest to the show. Um, We love following up on stories that we uh, have been following. Uh, Jamie Busard is the founder of Not So Hospitable, which has tracked sexual harassment in the Adelaide hospitality industry. When we chatted to Jamie a couple of years ago, uh, she had just launched an Instagram account which encouraged people to come forward with their own stories of sexual harassment in HOSPO. She has now followed, um, I guess, that organic research up with something a little more structured. So, Jamie, welcome back to Dirty Linen. Thank you for having me back. It's great to chat after we were just figuring it out nearly two years. Yeah, that's right. Um, Let's put people in the picture who perhaps don't already know of you and, you know, the broad range of work that you do. Just give us a little bit of an intro to Jamie Busard. Ooh, okay. Um, A little bit of an insight into who I am. I am a Adelaide-based sexologist. Um, I'm a sexuality educator. Um, I also run my own business on the cusp, which uh, trains workplaces on sexual violence awareness training, bystander intervention training, um, and respectful relationships. I also have a fortnightly sex column here in Adelaide. Um, But I also started Not So Hospitable, which is an advocacy page that promotes um, essentially the reform and awareness and advocacy for sexual harassment and assault within hospitality in Australia. What inspired you to begin Not ho- no, not So Hospitable? What, what made you start it all off? Yeah, well, I guess I've always had uh, an understanding of what it's like to be in the hospo scene. I am a hospo girly through and through. Uh, I've worked in the space for um, you know, I, I don't know. I think I say different year every time I've been working in hospitality for around 14, 15 years. Um, you name it, I've done it. I have worked in, in events, um, festivals, fine dining restaurants, bars, cafes. My family owned an alcohol company and a venue as well. So I've got a really great understanding of the culture within it. And also growing up as a young woman in hospitality, I was exposed to sexual harassment culture pretty early on. Um, unfortunately. Um, but I love the hospitality industry. It's given me so many incredible skills and I think it's one of the best industries we can work in. The dark side of that coin, however, is that there's a really normalized culture of sexual harassment within the industry. And once I saw an article that was released to over two years ago now, um, it was an Adelaide publication and they essentially promoted a story of a venue owner here in Adelaide who was charged of raping one of his female staff members and he actually went to court and went to prison. Um, And I'd never seen an article written like that before and I shared it on my own social media. Um, And
that have the power to enforce changing laws and, and supporting our workers. So what were some of the key findings? Well, I found that, you know, a really large majority of these testimonies did involve sexual harassment or assault. 57% of the testimonies involved sexual harassment and 41 involved sexual assault. Um, also, you know, not surprisingly for me, but there was a big gender dynamic at play. So 89% of victims identified as female and 97% of perpetrators were reported to be male. Now, not surprising for a woman, but I think having those statistics published academically does matter because we we need to use this to leverage the understanding of, of gender power imbalances and sexism and misogyny within our industry. Um, not only that, I found that 23% of the perpetrators were a manager of that venue. So we're talking about abuse of power and exploitation of staff. That was a really big theme that was identified throughout my findings. Um, we found that 19% of perpetrators were owners of the venue. So again, if 22% of the perpetrators um, are managers, sorry, 23% of perpetrators are managers and 19% of perpetrators are owners, that's a really big issue because if staff are getting harassed or assaulted by their bosses, what are they supposed to do if they're trying to report or seek help for that? Not only that, but I also found that there was a really high percentage of underage grooming. Now, that was probably one of the more alarming findings. Um, I found that 33% of victims were under, sorry, were 15 years old or under. That's a lot of people that are under um, under 15. And we found that 44% were aged between 16 and 18. So you're looking at 77% of people were under 18 when they were harassed or assaulted. Um, so when we're talking about young people coming into hospitality, which I mean, you know, I started my first job in hospital. I was 14. Uh, I had no skills to adequ adequately prepare me for the types of things that I may experience as a young woman. Um, but if so many people are coming to the workforce so young and they're not being taught the tools and it's in such an unregulated industry, that's really, really problematic, not only for the hospitality industry, but for anyone that has children or cares about young people in Australia. Yeah, it's so true. I also, that statistic also jumped out at me as particularly shocking and distressing. And as you say, when it's the, you know, managers and perhaps owners that are perpetrators, they're really, it really is hard for people to know where to turn. You know, as we know, hospitality is largely made up of, of small businesses. There's no HR department that you can go and knock on the door of and, you know, have a private conversation about something that is concerning. So, um, yeah, people are left to carry uh, these experiences with them. Um, oh, totally. And, you know, when we talk about small businesses um, and the, the many hats that you have to wear as a small business, the HR team is also the owner, is also the head chef, is also the front of house, is also doing the rostering and also has two or three staff that are all underage females. And when we talk about, you know, when I talk about such an unregulated industry, there's, there's such, there's no best practice in terms of how to how to enact these reporting structures and um in my findings i also found that 48 percent of the victims said that either nothing was done by management after reporting and 29 percent of victims said that they felt that they couldn't report report due to a work perpetrator um because it was a manager or an owner and eight percent said that their shifts were cut or they were unfairly dismissed so you're really seeing that that lack of regulation where there's no strong reporting structures in place, but not only that, that I really believe that managers and business owners and supervisors don't understand the importance of having reporting structures in place. No one's educated them really either. No one's holding them accountable. Something else that I found pretty shocking was the a number of instances where alcohol or other drugs were involved. Um, can you talk about those findings? Yeah, absolutely. So we found that 77% of incidents involved alcohol. Now that's a really high percentage. Again, not as surprising for me because, you know, for anyone that's worked in the hospitality industry, um, food and beverage is everything. And there's a really big drinking and drug culture and there's a huge knockoff culture. So if you're not drinking at work, which a lot of people do, um, you then finish work at, you know, I don't know whether it's 12 o'clock or 3am or really late and you have a knockoff and then that kind of perpetuates that drinking culture 
it a lot of these incidents are involving alcohol because a lot of it it does involve late night knockoff culture as well. Um, and we also found that 19% of incidents involved drugs. Now, we also know for anyone in the industry that there is a really big problematic issue with drug abuse within the industry for an industry that is so, there is so much pressure to perform. You are working such long hours, especially chefs and within the, the kitchen space. Um, it is a really problematic issue. So when we're looking at the amount of incidents that involve alcohol and drugs, that's something that we really need to be able to talk to. And especially if it's being used by perpetrators to take advantage of their employees, you know, the understanding of consent is so blurred within Australian culture. There was research that came out recently that showed that 50% of Australian adults don't understand consent. That's an issue because then when you're putting drugs and alcohol in the mix in a late night kind of area, that's just a petri dish for harassment. I mean, we're talking a lot about harassment by managers and owners, but of course, you know, customers are also implicated in some of your research. Can you talk about some of the hospitality industry norms that serve to perpetuate this sort of culture? Yeah, well, some of the things I found was that we have um, we have a really big priority in our industry of the customer is always right. And there seems to be this unspoken or spoken, to be quite frank with you, rule that the customer is always right and you need to do what's in the best interest of the customer, not what's in the best interest of the staff. So if customers are coming in and they're sexually harassing or sexually assaulting a staff member, but the manager or the supervisor or the owner doesn't want to do anything about it because that specific customer spends a lot of money, that's essentially telling not only the staff and the patrons, but our culture in general, that money buys harassment. And it is because that's what we're seeing constantly. And there's a really big issue with that because staff well-being must always come first. You don't see that happening in offices the same way that you do in venues. You wouldn't allow someone who's working in an office space to have a client come in and sexually harass or sexually assault them and go, oh, well, they're paying a lot of money. Um, that's fine. Don't worry about it. If you're uncomfortable, just walk away. Or do you need to go home? Um, don't don't say anything, you know, their money is really good here. So I think that that problematic conversation of the customer is always right. We really need to shift that dial onto the customer may be a paying customer and that's important for our industry because we're a service industry, but it should never be at the detriment of a staff member who is working. Yeah, you're making me think, Jamie, about a, a recent podcast guest, Katie Grankowski, who owns Maggie's Snacks and Liquor in, in Brunswick in Melbourne. And Katie, is, we, it was a chat basically about misogyny in the industry. And Katie, as a, as a new owner of a business, managing a lot of um, staff, a lot of young staff, a lot of female staff, was so strong on that, you know, that the customer is not always right and that staff welfare is pro- is the priority um, and was, um, you know, having experienced a lot of harassment herself and, you know, having developed strong values around it was um, just really clear about the business, the priorities of the business. And I think when you step back a little bit from, you know, that customer's money on that night or on that day, when you think about the longevity of a business and the industry itself with, you know, staff members who feel supported and want to stay working, um, then, you know, you can have a very different view of what's good for a business long term. Definitely. And when you talk about staff retention, I mean, the average, the median aid for a hospitality worker and gender is a 22 year old female. So when we actually have more females than males in the hospitality industry, but we're also seeing that the majority of people in positions of power of male, there's actually a really huge barrier for women to do better because if they're getting sexually harassed or assaulted, chances are they get to a point where they leave because they're unsafe or they're not able to progress in an inclusive and supportive environment. I mean, the hospitality industry is always, in terms of culture, always told me at least, you know, starting my first job at 14, that sexual harassment is a normal part of being a woman in hospital and that you kind of have to just get over it because that's what it's like. And when you try to complain or report, you're told that that's something that you need to just accept. And I I personally refused to accept that. I, I don't think that that is how we're supposed to work within our industry, it's the bare minimum that we're not getting harassed at work. Um, everyone should be able to thrive and feel safe and not be sexually harassed at work. And we shouldn't have to be taught to 
you know, be sexually objectified or wear shorter skirts or flirt with people because we're women. Um, So I think really changing and disrupting that norm is also really important. But at the same time, I found a lot of boys will be boys culture. Now, we've heard that a lot before, you know, boys will be boys. um, Culture is something that I think has been talked about over the past few years. But hospitality a lot of the time is a boys club. And when you match Boys will be boys with 97% of perpetrators being male as well as, you know, what I would say is an industry-wide complacency to sexual harassment and assault where people are seeing what's going on and not doing anything about it. It's a really toxic industry and there's a lot that we need to work towards in terms of like active reform for a culture that's so normalised that when young men and women, but mostly men, start off these jobs and they're also watching like sponges how other people act in this industry. If they're watching their older managers and supervisors normalise sexual harassment culture, they grow up thinking that's normalised and they become perpetrators without even really realising it. And that's that's an issue as well. Yeah, it's definitely an issue. And you've made me think of another recent podcast with a woman, you know, who identifies as older woman within the industry, Kim Curry, who's owner of the Zin House in Mudgee. And she talked about going to an industry event and just feeling very uncomfortable with the boys club, the yaka yaka arms crossed, standing in groups, just guys being dickheads, basically, and how uncomfortable that made her. Um it's certainly it's an it's certainly an, an issue. It is such an issue, and I think the thing that really like sparked my anger. It really I'm saying I'm this is my phrase at the moment. I'm saying boiling my milk. The thing that really boiled my milk recently was that not only did did the workplaces that I've worked in in Adelaide, big groups, mind you, famous groups, people that win awards for best restaurant all the time, when they're brushing these instances under the rug, and their owners, they what, I, there was a member of a group based in Adelaide, who wasn't allowed in their venue, their own venue, after 6 p.m. because of how many women staff he'd harassed. And that was something that we just all had to accept and get along with, and nobody fought back against that. And I found that that was so inherently wrong and dangerous that there needed to be something done. Um, It's not – that's – it's such a crazy thing to me that people would be able to know that and pretend that nothing's happening. And – actively turn away and actively not do something about it or stand up because they're worried about being labelled whistleblowers or they're worried about losing their jobs. But at the detriment of what? The detriment of the the well-being and actual physical safety of young female staff. It's not good enough. Yeah, that's just a staggering lack of accountability. Um, and, yeah, it's frankly mind-blowing. Um, Jamie, You've done the report. You've got this academic research. You did it for a reason. What has the response been? I did do it for a reason. Um, honestly, I mean, the response in terms of media and our community and the hospitality industry, it's been quite amazing. I think people are really wanting to see more done in this space because I think that people are just, they seem to be crying and yelling to a wall that is doing nothing in return. So um, from a community point of view, it's it's been phenomenally well received unfortunately from a government point of view I have heard radio silence which is super super disappointing um I have had some incredible people on my side the Lord Mayor of Adelaide um Jane Lomax Smith she's been a really amazing advocate for this space and is is helping advocate to try and get the attention of um ministers and um the commissioner and and the attorney general who have the power to actually do something about it but Um, They have been extremely silent, which has been really disappointing. But at the same time, it it just kind of gives me more fuel to the fire. If if they're going to stay silent, I'm going to make more noise. (laughs) Well, we love to help you make some noise. Oh, my God, please. Uh, It's... um I mean, so there's the Sex Discrimination Act, um, a Commonwealth Act in Australia, which was amended in December 2022, and that amendment imposes a legal obligation on organisations and businesses to take proactive and meaningful action to prevent relevant unlawful conduct from occurring in the workplace or in connection to work. Now, some of that unlawful conduct includes sexual harassment in connection with work, sex-based harassment, um, uh, other related acts of victimisation, uh, workplace environments that are hostile on the grounds of sex. I mean, this is pretty clear that businesses have a positive 
requirement to act, not just to wait around for, you know, someone to come and complain, but that they need to foster positive working environments. How much do you think this uh, amendment has permeated the industry? Yeah, so you're talking about positive duty laws, which um, uh, is an incredible law that's been passed. Um, So, yeah, it means all workplaces, yeah, have a a responsibility to be proactive instead of reactive. And, you know, we've seen with a lot of these instances before, it's all been reactive. It's all been workplaces reacting to an incident that's happened. And now basically that's saying that now legally workplaces, including everyone in the hospitality to anyone listening out there, they have to be proactive and do something about it. Now, what that looks like is that includes training their staff adequately. It includes enforcing policies. It includes establishing strong reporting mechanisms and conducting regular assessments of workplace safety culture. Um, Now, it's an incredible law, but what I've found is that every single business that I've talked to doesn't know about it. Um, There's been no campaigning from our government to actually um, spread the awareness of this changing law. And now businesses are really going to be held accountable. And if something happens in a workplace and someone gets sexually harassed and they go to court, the business is now going to be held accountable and they can get charged a lot of money. Now we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. And because this law has just passed, we're actually going to see a lot more cases coming up. I'm a lot more, yeah, trials coming through court and it's going to be a new standard. So that number is only going to increase financially. So, you know, if the moral and ethical obligation of protecting your staff well-being wasn't enough to do it for businesses, now there's a huge risk mitigation point of view where they where they legally have to do this and if not, they're essentially screwed. So it's really important for businesses to be aware of this changing law and understand what it actually takes from a holistic point of view to change workplace culture so they're not held liable for sexual harassment and sexual assault anymore. And that's part of um, what I do and what my business is, is, is working with hospitality venues to to train their staff, train their managers, but also educate the managers and the owners on these positive duty laws and what what it actually takes now to create a safe environment. So, Jamie, you know, you talk about you undertake this training with businesses. Um, I'd love you to give us an insight into it. So let's take the classic overworked independent restaurateur. As you say, they're wearing a million hats. Um, Times are tight. You know, it's hard for them to add another, you know, something else to their list of things to do. What kinds of things should they be doing to foster a positive working environment? Well, make sure that they have strong reporting structures in place. You know, a lot of the times with most hospitality venues that I've worked in, no one's ever actually educated the staff on what those reporting structures look like. So make sure you're having regular conversations about the streamline of that reporting structure. Make sure your managers and your supervisors are aware of that and their responsibility under positive duty laws about the importance of reporting and documenting that. Not only that, but there needs to be a process in which someone handles that report and it doesn't get brushed under the rug. So what do you do when you have that information? Um, There is a really big importance level of the education side. How are you training your staff to be safe at work? You know, are you training your staff on bystander intervention, which is being able to be an active bystander if you see sexual harassment or assault happening in the moment and how to do that safely. What tools do they have? Do they feel confident enough to be able to handle that? If not, you need to bring in a training provider to help support and build the confidence and the knowledge of those staff. You know, we work in a human-facing industry. It demands a human-facing result. Not only that, but what are your policies? It's no longer good enough that you have a one-sentence policy on sexual harassment and assault, you need to read through that. But also, do the managers know what that policy is? Do the staff know what that policy is? Does the owner know what that policy is? And on top of that, do your staff know what their legal rights are? Do the managers know what the legal rights are of the staff? Does the owner understand what their legal responsibilities are as an owner to enforce and educate their staff on those rights? What happens if there's an instance of of harassment and assault? Have you talked about that kind of thing before? Do you have open conversations with your staff where you're getting feedback on how to do better? I think for anyone that owns a business or is a manager or a supervisor of a business and hospitality, 
create the space for staff to be able to have these conversations safely, go out of your way to have these conversations with them and make it an ongoing regular conversation. This isn't like a one, one time conversation. That's it forever. It should be happening at every single staff meeting and those staff meetings should be happening every two to four weeks. The training should be happening every few months and every time you have a new staff member, you need to make sure they're being adequately trained. Um, we're all, or most of us, not all of us, but especially in positions of power, I'd like to hope that most of us are adults. We're all intelligent enough to be able to hold down work. We're all charismatic enough to work in a hospitality industry. We need to be critical thinkers in terms of how our behaviours and our words and our actions are influencing not only the culture within your specific venue, but how that culture then implements and affects Australian culture. You know, when we're talking about sexual violence, when we're talking about domestic violence, when we're talking about all the things that we are currently experiencing and being exposed to collectively, each individual has a responsibility to do better in their circle. So that's what I would recommend it starts with. It's actually quite a powerful idea, Jamie. actually had goosebumps while you were talking because I was thinking hospitality could be a leader in this space. Yeah, right. And I, I really want it to be. I believe that it is. And I think a lot of people are really scared to have these conversations and they're scared to even admit that it's a problem because they, they think that by talking about it, they are then admitting that their businesses are a part of it or they've done it. Now, regardless of whether you might have been a perpetrator in the past, I think that everyone has potentially fueled this kind of culture before, myself included. Statistically, there is research that backs that this is happening. And if you haven't had any reporting, that means that there's a really high chance that you have really bad reporting structures in place. So it starts with these conversations. And I, I, I believe that we can be a leader in this space. I think I want us to be a leader in this space. And hospitality is a weird industry where it involves everyone because we have the working side and the service industry side, but then we have all the patrons that come into our venues. It's literally everyone. There's not one human that doesn't eat or drink or buy food in some type of venue in Australia. We have a really big drinking culture and a really big food culture. So yeah, I don't know to everyone listening out there. I, we, we need to be leaders in the space and do better and, and pave the way for not only ourselves, but our future generations and these young kids coming into the industry, we can do a lot better. Jamie, thank you so much for your leadership in this space and for your yeah dogged pursuit of the academic um, backup to the research that you conducted a couple of years ago. I think it's really inspiring, really strong. And yeah, I'm really grateful. Thanks for sharing with us today. Thank you so much for having me. I'll talk, talk to you in another two years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't need to leave it that long. <laughs> Thanks for having me. This is Dirty Linen and I'm Danny Vallant. We air the issues that the hospitality industry finds hard to talk about, hearing from different people with unique perspectives. We want to hear from you as well. If you have something that needs to be said about a topic, get in touch so we can include your perspective. Contact us at dirtylinen at deepintheweeds.com.au or hit us up on Insta at Dirty Linen Podcast. We can't wait to hear from you.